Hey guys, I'm Dob, and today I'm back with another faction overview. We're going to be making our way through the old world once again. This time we're touching on the Beastmen. Yes, indeed, the Beasts of Chaos, as they are sometimes called. Uh, we're going to be going through the roster, strengths and weaknesses as a faction, and a few example builds. Again, the purposes of these videos, for those of you who haven't watched any of my faction overviews before, is to go through the entire roster, talk about each unit, its uses, and uh, kind of generally how the faction plays. Um, this is primarily to help teach you guys, obviously, uh, for those of you guys who haven't purchased the Beastmen or don't plan on purchasing the Beastmen, uh, you know, I go through the roster here and talk about the different units and what they can do so that you have a frame of reference to study your enemy, so to speak, prepare to fight the Beastmen, or, you know, if you're a Beastmen player or you're looking to just pick up the Beastmen as a faction to play, uh, then this build is also meant for you, uh, sorry, this, this video is also meant for you as well. So, uh, let's jump straight into it with the roster. Uh, so... First things first, we're going to go through the characters. Lords obviously come first, and the one single generic lord choice for the Beastmen uh, is going to be the Beast Lord. Now, obviously, this is being filmed uh, currently in the lead up to the release of the Vampire Coast. So, if you're watching this video for whatever reason at a later date, understand certain st stats may change. I also have a small, probably vain hope that they will add uh, some more characters like the generic uh, Minotaur Lord level character, the Doom Bull. Um, so, you know, there may be units that the Beastmen have on their roster that aren't necessarily in this video if you're watching this at a later date, but we're still going to go through everything that's currently in the game and uh, just talk about it how it's used. So, obviously, the Beast Lord starting out. Um, he's got uh, no mount or a chariot. The Razor Gore Chariot does give him armor piercing, anti infantry at the cost of some combat stats. Also gives him a bit more armor, obviously, more health as well. And it also gives him a substantial charge bonus of 95 as the current patch. Uh, it also gives him fear. The Razor Gore Char Chariot does cause fear, though it does not cause terror. And obviously the speed increase that comes from being on a mount, um, at least a mount that's fast. It's, it's no corpse cart, definitely. So uh, anyway, uh, in terms of his abilities, he has some really nice buff abilities that make him one of the better support lords in the game, in my opinion. He's got Bloodlust, which gives an ally 20% armor piercing. This is a targeted ability. It's not game-breaking by any means, but casting it, especially on a very high-value unit that does good armor-piercing damage, that can get you some really good value. This one, though, the Apocalyptic Vision, of course, melee attack and defense buffs are always powerful. Melee attack buffs in particular um, can be very, very useful when you're going up against high, high melee defense factions, and this guy's got Apocalyptic Vision, which is a pretty decent one, only lasts 18 seconds, so it's relatively short, but does give 16 leadership and 26 melee attack. The leadership, Beastmen tend to struggle a little bit with across the board, similar to Greenskins or other factions, um, but um, yeah, he does have that apoc apocalyptic vision. In terms of items, he's got this Totem of Rust, which is a constant area of effect minus six armor. Nothing crazy, but it is there, certainly, and uh, the item I think is much better, and one of the things that makes this guy such a good support character is this Horn of the First Beast. So it gives, uh, for 35 seconds, in a quite large area of effect, 18% charge bonus, leadership, and again, 26 melee attack. So you have two melee attack buffs with this guy that you can kind of layer one after the other or stack on top of each other if you really have to. Although I would definitely recommend you layer them one after the other if possible. Um, but yeah, you've got both of those buffs uh, to be able to buff your unit's melee attack stats. And combined with the fact that even, I mean, kitted out, this guy's not super expensive. He is a quite cost-effective lord choice. Moving on to uh, one of the legendary lords, probably one of the worst legendary lords in the game, sadly. I mean, he's not hes not terrible. He's not as bad as some others, but he's certainly up there. Kazrak the One-Eye. Um, yeah, what makes Kazrak so bad is just that he's uh, hes not that much better than a Beast Lord, and he doesn't have the support buffs that the Beast Lord does. Granted, he's a little bit better in combat. Oh, I also forgot to mention here the uh, the army-wide ability for the Beastmen. This, you're going to see this on pretty much every unit, is this Primal Fury. It's uh, similar to Frenzy. Gives charge bonus, melee attack, speed, and immunity to psychology if the unit's leadership is above 50%. So if their leadership's good, they're getting this Primal Fury buff. Gives them a bit of extra speed, melee attack, charge bonus, and every beat... Uh 
almost every Beastman unit has this ability. So just keep that in mind as we're looking at these base stats that typically these are going to be buffed up slightly, you know, at least on at the onset of the battle, certainly. But anyway, going back to Kazrak here, he also has a Razor Gore Chariot, which again uh, nerfs his melee attack stats, but gives him significantly better charge bonus, armor piercing, anti-infantry, and uh, still the same armor value though, obviously much faster. He does have Apocalyptic Vision and Deadly Onslaught, but uh, obviously doesn't have Horn of the First Beast. He has some other items, Scourge, which is okay, I guess. I mean, it gives him better melee stats, which is certainly good, basically like a Harmonic Convergence, 26 melee attack, 27 melee defense on himself, and also gives him Poison, which is definitely decent. It's definitely not game-breaking, and there are a lot better legendary items out there, but it's not terrible. This one, the Dark Mail, uh, they've tried to buff this one so many times, but I just, it really is just still so situational and expensive that I would almost never recommend you take this. Uh, basically, it has a relatively small area of effect, you know, relatively speaking, 40 meters, and uh, if, if it hits a caster basically if a caster comes in that 40 meter area of effect they're going to get minus nine melee defense and 18 armor which i mean minus nine melee defense is pretty pretty solid but that's not the highest values and because it's so situational it has a relatively short range i just find that the dark mail is really not the most useful item in the game so uh, part of what makes kazrak kind of underwhelming especially compared to the beast lord is again the beast lord's cheaper and he has better support buffs granted not quite as good in combat but I mean, just with the the kaiju monsters and the world beaters that are out there, Kazrak being better, slightly better at combat really doesn't make enough of a difference for him. Uh, moving on to undoubtedly the most meta pick, the one that you will see by far and away the most often in every single matchup, Morgur the Shadow Gave. So why do you see Morgur so much? Well, on paper his stats aren't that great. Only 15 armor is actually really poor. Uh, 55 melee attack with poisons, not bad. 45 melee defense isn't terrible. He has decent weapon strength, no mount options whatsoever, so he's only on foot. But, obviously, he has regeneration. Yes, indeed. The coveted uh, self-healing lord. Uh, this guy's got it, along with his decent-ish melee defense. He's also got extremely heavy missile resistance of 75%, meaning he's basically impossible to shoot. He's also got magic resistance of 25%, as if that wasn't enough, so shooting him with magic missiles is basically pointless. Um, in terms of his other abilities, he's got Spirit Essence of Chaos and the Stave of Ruinous Corruption. Both of these summon Chaos Spawns. They only have one charge each, so he gets a maximum of two Chaos Spawns summons total, but they work a little bit differently. The uh, stab, Stave of Ruinous Corruption is simply a castable, you know, you can pop that, not anywhere, but anywhere within range um, at any time, and there's no conditional effects to it, so just gives you a nice Chaos Spawn summon. Very, very useful, certainly. The other one is a little bit trickier to use. Sometimes it's very beneficial, sometimes it's not as good, although certainly any time you can get a free unit of Chaos Spawn is not a bad thing, um, but basically this this uh, particular ability here will finish off a unit uh, that's not a Lord or Hero, that's below 20% HP, uh, that's in that area of effect. So uh, you can sort of bait this onto a lower value unit, for example, if you run in like some peasant mobs or something and they just get absolutely massacred. Now, they'll probably run away before their 20% HP, but let's say you rally them after they run away and they're about 20% HP, you run them in that area of effect and boom, you got a Chaos spawn out of a unit of peasant mobs, whereas it, alternately, if if you know if the if the beastman player gets the engagement they want, they're able to trap in like let's say some Grail Knights. Um, you know they trap them in with some some mobile units and they get them low enough on HP, and then Morgan runs into into range and boom that unit of Grail Knights that could have still had a substantial impact on the battle, especially if given some healing is all of a sudden just gone. There's no ability to bring them back or try and use them at all, right? So you can use it to finish off very high value units, but alternately, if your opponent's, you know, really on point, they can sacrifice a low tier unit to draw it out. And then, you know, because summoned units degrade, sometimes I've seen this tactic work before where you run a cheap unit in that's very damaged, they summon the chaos spawn, and then you basically just hold back until those summon spawn are almost completely or mostly degraded. That way you don't really have to fight them much in melee. 
But anyway, that's more or less all there is to Morker. He's also got a leadership buff and a speed buff, but that's not really much to talk, to talk about. And again, you're going to see this guy pretty much across the board. One other thing to note quickly is that he is weak to fire damage. Uh, a lot of, like, Flaming Sword of Ruin, for example, gives magic and fire. So because of the magic resistance and the fire resistance, it's not actually going to give you that much benefit here. But regular flaming attacks, things like the Banner of Eternal Flame, you know... Uh, all the High Elf Dragons and the Chaos Dragon, uh, Fireborn, any unit that does fire damage baseline is going to beat the brakes off Morker because he has low armor, doesn't have the best stats in the world, and he has uh, weakness to fire as well. So, just a bit of a note there. Moving on to the final Legendary Lord and another pretty decent one, uh, Malagor the Dark Omen. He's the caster Legendary Lord for the Beastman. He's got uh, the best Winds of Magic recharge rate of any Beastman caster because he has access to Arcane Conduit as well as uh, this one here, Unholy Power, which gives him a better recharge rate. He also has something Wicked This Way Comes, which is an area of effect minor leadership debuff. Not really a whole lot, but it's something. And of course, he has Lore of Wild. Again, I will refer you guys to my guides playlist where I have a guide on every single lore of magic Including the race specific lores like the lore of wild But just quickly here does give him the ability to summon a Sigor. He has a few direct damage and explosion options as well as a super powerful buff spell in Mantle of Garok He also has this item here that just gives plus 12 leadership in an area of effect It's honestly not amazing, but considering the beastmen are a relatively low leadership faction If you have the extra points this item can potentially be worth it Although, typically, if you're bringing Malagor, the goal is to get him as cheap as possible, so you don't see this item brought too often. But, uh, anyway, moving on to the heroes, we've got four flavors of Bray Shaman. Of course, this is the generic caster. We've got Lore of Beasts, Lore of Death, Lore of Shadows, and, of course, Lore of Wild, the race-specific lore for the Beastmen. And uh, again, I've got guides on all these lores of magic. In terms of the casters themselves, they do have access to the Razor Gore Chariot. Again, same as before, anti-infantry uh, armor piercing, good charge bonus, better armor. Uh, these guys on the Chariot aren't as good as the lords on the Chariot, but still gives them some good offensive power and mobility. And then in terms of items, they've got this Jagged Dagger, which is an awesome... Uh, item for a caster to have gives a uh, great increase to power reserve and improved power recharge rate so eventually essentially makes them uh, be able to get more winds of magic uh, it is a conditional melee recharge though and it only lasts for 17 seconds so it's not the most powerful magic item recharge in the world but it does have multiple uses unlike something like say the power stone for example so it, you know it does have some benefits there also has this uh, hag tree fetish which just gives a self minus percent Minus 50% miscast chance, which isn't wildly useful, but if if you know for a fact that you're going to be overcasting a certain spell, and yeah, maybe you bring it, I'm not really sure. It seems seems a bit expensive for what you get out of it, even at 55 points. But anyway, we've only got one other hero left to talk about, the old Gorbold. Yes, indeed. The anti-large, armor-piercing uh, monster that he is. Unfortunately, as it stands right now, Gorbel has some serious mass issues where he gets tossed around like it's nobody's business. I mean, he I've seen him fly literally hundreds of feet through the air, and it is absolutely absurd. Uh, that being said, in, in matchups where you're not going to face a lot of single-entity monsters, Gorbel actually can be quite good, especially at dealing with traditional heavy cavalry. Things like, uh, you know, Grail Knights again, uh, Dragon Princes, things like that, Gorbel can do very well against, especially if he's supporting another unit, because he's, you know, standing in the middle of a blob, doing that huge swing, you know, doing a ton of, ton of armor-piercing anti-large damage, and then uh, the other units can be taking the hits for him, so certainly can be powerful in some matchups. In terms of his abilities, he's got a few here. This uh, Slaughterer's Call is a nice area of effect buff spell, gives a, a constant 5 melee attack, 8 leadership, and 8% charge bonus. Uh, if he's in melee, which it's a little bit odd to give charge bonus once he's already in melee, but never mind. Uh, he's also got uh, Foe Seeker and Deadly Onslaught, as well as the Banner of Fallen Kings. So if he gets below 50% HP, then he'll get a minor weapon strength buff, which is, you know, not bad. And this item here is a particularly powerful item. The Axe of Men lasts for 46 seconds, which is a really long time in Total War Warhammer. Uh, and it makes him cause terror and makes him unbreakable. I have used this item to very good effect on a handful of occasions. It can be a bit situational, but certainly the causing terror and making him unbreakable if you need him to stay in a certain fight 
or if you need him to drop a big terror bomb, uh, the Axe of Men is a very nice item to have. A great little toolkit item for Gorbel, certainly. Uh, moving on now to the infantry. As a general rule, Beastman infantry are all very light, except for Bestigor, um, and aren't generally terribly effective. They can certainly be cost effective in the right situation. But uh, let's start with the Ungors, coming in three varieties, spears, spears with shields, and shields and hand weapons. So the spears obviously have anti-large, uh, not the best AP values, in fact only 5 AP per swing, which is pretty poor. Um, but again, they do have this Primal Fury buff, which gives them a bit better stats, and uh, makes them a bit faster and everything. They also have immune to psychology while, they, while their leadership is high, which isn't saying much. They only have 50% base, but still, it's something. Charge defense against large and all that, and they're expendable. So all the Ungor units have that expendable trait, meaning if they run away, they won't worry your non-expendable units. They still will worry the other Ungors, certainly, but... Uh, uh, and then obviously the Ungor herd. Now uh, the main differences here between the uh, the spear and the hand weapon variant is the hand weapon variant has stock and vanguard, and obviously no charge defense and no anti large. But uh, it's, I've always found it odd that the spearmen don't have stock or vanguard yet the regular Ungor herd do. But it does make them kind of a decent ambush unit. I mean they do have pretty crap stats for their cost. I mean, even without the uh, the Beastman buff, if we go ahead and just compare to the, the good old measuring stick Empire State Troop Swordsman, you can see the Swordsman has significantly better stats almost across the board, or has slightly more health and a little bit faster with a little bit higher charge. Um, but again, even with the the buffs from Primal Fury, the Ungor Herd is really going to struggle to uh, compete with the Empire State Troop Swordsmen. So, not the best low tier unit in the world. They tend to struggle to be cost effective. But uh, we do also have one Regiment of Renown for the Ungor Spearman Herd with shields. The Destroyers of Drakwald, they get significantly better melee defense, obviously being Regiment of Renown. They pick up poison, uh, have better leadership and melee attack as well. So. Not a bad Regiment of Renown, certainly for 600 points, can give you a nice option there. Moving on to the Gores, we've got Gore Herds with Shields, Gore Herds with two hand weapons, and a Regiment of Renown to talk about as well. So the Gore Herds with Shields, obviously, shielded variant of the regular Gore Herds. They both have the same armor, leadership, uh, you know, health, speed, and everything. The main difference is going to be in the combat stats. Obviously, the Gore Herd without Shields have lower attack, but better, uh, sorry, uh, they have better attack, but lower defense, better weapon strength, and charge. Um, yeah, the Gore Herds with shields are also a bit cheaper as well, which is one thing to note, certainly. Um, personally, I prefer the Gore Herds with shields just because I find the, the higher melee defense is a little bit more important, especially because you have that uh, that Primal Fury to buff your melee attack already and your charge bonus and everything, so you really don't trade off that much by bringing the Gore Herds with shields over the regular Gore Herds. At least that's been my experience. Let me know if you guys... I have learned something different, but in terms of the Regiment of Renown, we've got the Black Horns Ravagers. These guys obviously have better stats. They have better armor as well, which is always nice for the Beastmen. Um, they do also pick up uh, Stock, and they have the same trait that we're going to get to in a minute with the, the Centigors, the Rowdy trait. So essentially, as long as your unit's not wavering, this unit has perfect vigor, meaning it will never tire. It doesn't get tired from running, charging, fighting. It'll always be at perfect vigor as long as its leadership is good. So, very powerful trait to have, as, as we'll discuss more in a minute. And finally, the heavy infantry of the Beastmen, we've got the Bestigor. So they only come in one variant, variant mainly, um, outside of the Regiment Around, obviously, but they just have great weapons, no shields, obviously, and not the greatest melee defense, but solid health, very good armor piercing damage and attack stats, and of course 95 armor, making them the heaviest beastman infantry by far, good charge bonus, and again they have that primal fury buff. Korok's Man Rippers are the Regiment of Renown. They trade out their Great Axes for Halberds, giving them charge defense against large. They've also got anti-large armor piercing and much better melee defense. A 44 melee defense, not bad at all. And uh, don't lose out on a, a whole lot of weapon strength regardless. Obviously, slightly lower charge bonus, but again, they have charge defense, so pretty good trade-off there. Uh, anyway, moving on, only one missile infantry unit. We've got more Ungors, the Ungor Raiders. These guys are a nice, cheap skirmish unit. They don't really have a ton going for them. I mean, they do have stock, certainly. They're expendable. They also have the Primal Fury, which means they actually have some of the better attack stats um, or 
and defensive stats for that matter of some of the other skirmishers in this particular cost range. So eh, eh, they're okay in melee. You certainly don't want them to be in melee, but if they get charged by, for example, like a low tier uh, light cavalry, it's not a complete guarantee that they're going to lose. You know, something like uh, wolf riders or uh, regular hounds or something like that. It can deal with them reasonably well. It's it's tough, but uh, you know, it does give you a nice ranged option, and certainly they're cheap, and they also have 90 unit models, meaning they have a higher volume of fire than most other skirmishers. So they have a similar volume of fire to something like a free company or a goblin archer as opposed to regular skirmishers, which have, what, 68 models? So moving on, uh, one of the more powerful elements of the Beastmen roster is the Centigors, and uh, the Beastmen are definitely one of the best mobility factions in the game because of Centigors. What makes them so good? Well, honestly, their stats aren't that good on paper. Certainly, they're very fast, and this uh, Primal Fury makes them even faster. Um, they have decent enough charge bonus. It's not amazing, but they have light armor and not the best stats, but it's mainly just their their mobility and their, their ability to stay fresh. So again, all Centigors have this rowdy trait that we just saw earlier, meaning they have perfect vigor as long as their leadership is good, and that means that they can play the hit and run game like it's nobody's business because they'll never get tired uh, as long as their leadership stays up they can keep cycle charging keep hitting running you know pulling back singling out isolated units just running around like chickens with their heads cut off no problem all day as long as their leadership stays good again that's one of the reasons why they're so powerful um typically with most beastman builds you'll see quite a few centigors of various uh weapon types so you've got the sword and uh i guess these guys have spears although they don't actually have anti-large but they do have a mi uh, minor missile block chance 30 percent and uh, slightly better combat stats than the Centigors with great weapons, which is the next variant we're going to look at. Obviously, these guys have better weapon strength and armor piercing, 27 armor piercing, which is quite heavy. Um, and they, uh, other than that, they're almost exactly the same. Slightly more expensive, but a very powerful hit and run unit, especially with that heavy armor piercing damage. They do have a... Uh, Regiment of Renown as well in the Sons of Goros. These guys pick up magic damage, which is not something that the Beastmen have a ton of. You may occasionally face ethereal units, especially because the Beastmen are a little bit weak to terror. We'll get more to that in a minute, but um, those magical attacks on these guys are very key. They also have Guardians, so if they happen to be fighting nearby one of your heroes or lords, they'll pick up that 18% physical resistance, uh, the hero will, rather. Um, and then, yeah, for the final variant, we've got a ranged variant, Centigors with throwing axes. These guys have been the bane of many, many players. They do great armor-piercing missile damage, and again, that rowdy trait means that they can stay out in front and keep chucking those axes until they're gone, and they won't get tired. And then they can charge in in the late game, and they'll still be more or less fresh as long as they haven't got caught out. So uh, Centigors with throwing axes definitely going to be a staple of any beastmen play and i would highly recommend if you're planning on picking up the beastmen as a, a faction that you want to play practice your micro practice your micro practice your micro some more because you're going to be microing these centigors with throwing axes a lot and it's one of the most critical pieces of your army generally so yeah just be prepared if you do take that up the centigors are one of the most powerful elements of the beastman army so certainly you want to be prepared to be able to micro them so moving on to monsters and beasts not surprisingly the beastmen have lots of beasts to choose from uh, we've got chaos warhounds chaos poison warhounds we'll see these guys in some other rosters but eh, not a whole lot they've just got uh, you know hound stats they're pretty poor but very fast they do have 60 unit models and the poison ones obviously have poison Moving on, we've got the Razorgore Herd. These guys are a quote-unquote feral type unit in that they they uh, do have this rampage trait. So when they get hurt, they'll go into a, an enraged state and you can't micro them. They do have a pretty heavy armor piercing damage, 24 unit models, decent-ish armor, okay leadership, not the best, but pretty much on par for what you expect for a feral unit. Decent enough speed, but that heavy armor piercing damage and the charge bonus means that these guys can be a very nice surprise pick, especially at only 600 points. They have high mass, they can block up cavalry and even counter charge relatively well, as long as it's not like an anti-large cavalry or something. Uh, generally, can be a very cost-effective unit, but very tricky to use because of that rampage trait. So just be aware, they also do cause fear. Uh, just generally a good uh, all-around sort of control type or uh, 
yeah, mobility type unit. Just generally very cost effective, especially if you don't want to invest fully in uh, centigors. We've also got harpies, another kind of mobile unit. These guys are flyers, obviously. 45 models, they do count as infantry size. Uh, one important thing to note, 44 weapon strength. Not amazing with 12 AP, but it's something. They have decent enough melee defense at 38, 22 melee attack, very light armor. They are relatively squishy. They are certainly squishier even than like fell bats. Uh, they can be squishier than Felbats and Carrion, just because they have lower melee defense, but they do have slightly more offensive power than those two units. So, uh, yeah, they can be a nice surprise pick. Uh, I don't find myself using them super, super often, just because I find Centigors and, uh, you know, Razigors, th those sorts of units, to be a little bit more cost-effective. But if you want to be able to contest the flying game, if you're worried about, like, let's say, Gyrocopters, for example, against the Dwarves, a couple units of Harpies can be some really nice insurance against that. We've also got the Chaos Spawn. So, uh, one thing I want to note here, uh, the Chaos Spawn for the Beastmen is different than the Chaos Spawn for uh, the Warriors of Chaos. This guy has Poison Attacks. Let's go ahead and compare one to one, actually. So, the Chaos Spawn for the Beastmen has Poison Attacks, and it also has this No Forest Penalty trait. In fact, most Beastmen large units have this No Forest Penalty trait, which means that they won't suffer penalties like large units normally do when they're fighting in a forest, obviously. Um, so it makes them much more useful in utilizing terrain, and indeed Beastmen are one of the most powerful factions that use utilizing terrain. More on that in a moment, but just to compare, uh, the, tr the poison is and the forest penalty get traded out at the cost of a bit of weapon strength. So the uh, Beastman Chaos spawn doesn't hit quite as hard, but that poison and the forest penalty does make it an okay option. It's certainly not uh, a meta pick by any means, but can be a good surprise pick against factions which have terror uh, or a lot of low armor infantry or both. Uh, obviously, they're unbreakable, so they won't get terrified away like so many of your other units. They may be able to hold the line while you regroup, uh, you know, other lower leadership units. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty decent. Again, you're going to see these guys from Morker, so you will see them in a lot of Beastman battles. Whether or not you bring an actual unit of them is another matter entirely. Moving on, we've got three variants of Minotaurs with a Regiment of Renown, and unfortunately Minotaurs, at least as of the recording of this, aren't in the best place. They really tend to struggle in a lot of aspects. They're expensive, number one, uh, and number two, they're squishy. So uh, you can see only 35 armor on the regular variant. The shielded variant does go up to 45 armor, um, but they just generally, I mean, they have good offensive stats, very heavy weapon strength, you know, 12 unit models, and decent decent combat stats, although the melee defense of the Great Weapon variant and the Dual Weapon variant certainly leaves something to be desired, especially with that low armor. It means that lower tier units can get consistent hits against them, uh, which is really, really rough. For a unit this expensive that doesn't have the ability to heal at all, taking damage from low tier units can be potentially really bad. Uh, it is worth noting that uh, Minotaurs do have this Blood Greed, so let's see. Uh, if an enemy comes within a 70 meter range, then uh, they'll get 12% or yeah, 12% speed, immune psychology, and 12 leadership. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and is disabled if their leadership is broken, obviously. So interesting little buff there. Um, and I've kind of referenced or alluded to this a little bit just in talking so far, but the Minotaurs with shields, I think, are going to be the best uh, variant for you to you do for you to use. And obviously, the uh, great weapons have anti-large, which is awesome. But at the, the Minotaurs with shields have a missile block chance, which is actually quite substantial. 50%, uh, sorry, 55% missile, missiles from the front will be blocked by that shield, which makes them significantly tankier against missiles. Both these other variants will suffer very badly, even to non-AP missile fire, again, because of that lack of armor. These guys, too, do pick up slightly more armor because of the shield, and it's not a lot, but everything helps. And most importantly of all, they get significantly better melee defense than both the other variants of Minotaurs, which makes them by far the most cost effective because they're able to stay in battle the longest. And that goes doubly for their Regiment of Renown variant, the Butchers of Kalkengard. So check out these guys' stats. 60 melee defense for a monstrous infantry that has regeneration and fear and terror. 
These guys are world beaters, make no mistake. An incredibly powerful unit. They still only have 45 armor, though, so you got to be very careful, especially for heavy shock units that do fire damage, uh, like, for example, Knights of the Blazing Sun or the Fireborn. They can do a lot of damage, or like uh, Demogriff Knights, for example, with uh, with uh, Banner of Eternal Flame, will destroy these guys. But, I mean, they will give it back relatively well, and that 60 melee defense means that uh, if you're on top of your micro at kind of cycling them in and out of combat and making sure they aren't dropping unit models, you can make these guys incredibly tanky and super, super annoying for your opponent to kill. So, one of the best regiments renowned in the game, in my opinion, actually. And uh, now we've just got a few more big monsters left. These are the big single entity boys. We've got the Saigor, a unique monster for the Beastmen. It's a monstrous artillery piece like some others we've seen. Um, Although, unlike others we've seen, this is more of a big splash damage. A lot of the other monster artillery pieces are the, like, ballista or cannon type, where they're uh, more of meant against, like, single entities, whereas the Saigor is meant against blobs of anything, because it does a ludicrous amount of armor-piercing damage in a pretty sizable area of effect, meaning it's very decent at shooting at elite infantry, elite cavalry, you know, traditional-style cavalry that have about 45 unit models, um... Just in general, it's going to be a devastating weapon if it connects. The regular Saigor is not super accurate, but the Regiment of Renown variant, the Eye of Morslid, is substantially more accurate. Obviously, being a big monster, it causes fear and terror, and it also has this ability here, uh, map-wide plus 25% miscast chance for your opponent. So, obviously, if you're fighting a magic-heavy faction, can be quite useful to have that on the field. Uh, maybe not wildly useful, but it can potentially get you some free damage on your opponent's caster, which is always nice. Um, the Eye of More Sleep, though, does pick up an extra ability, well, a few extra abilities. Uh, number one, it has magic damage in melee and at ranged. It's basically holding a giant piece of amber rather than a big rock, so it has uh, magic damage, slightly higher missile damage, obviously for the faster fire rate, and it's much more accurate since it is a Regiment of Renown. And it also has this ability here, the Warp Gaze. This is a three-charge uh, pin-in-place ability, hard snare, as I like to call them, in the vein of, like, uh, Nets of Amentok or Prey of Arathrema. One of the few that the... Uh, sorry, the only one that the Beastmen have access to. And it also happens to be on one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, powerful artillery unit in the game. I mean, this guy's a world beater in melee. He's got f 52 melee attack with heavy weapon strength, and that warp gaze gives him a great control ability. Uh, not to mention, he has extremely long range, so you can kind of park this guy in the back and then use your mobile units to harass your opponent continuously as this guy's just dropping rocks on them, and they can't ever get to him, and it's just... Uh, it's such a powerful unit. And I guess that kind of brings us nicely into our, our tactics and builds. Um, when you're playing as a Beastman, the name of the game is, at least from my experience, using the terrain to your advantage. The Beastmen are one of, if not the best faction at using, especially like broken up, forested terrain, you know, line of sight blockages, uh, just, you know, ridges, hills, those sorts of things. Just generally util utilizing terrain to your advantage, positioning yourself in a position to be successful. <laughs> Said position twice there, but anyway. Um... So, what do I mean by that? Well, on maps with forest, obviously, you have that no forest penalty with a lot of your units. You can hide. You also have the mobility to set up some ambushes that can be very hard for your opponent to get away from. You've got this very powerful artillery piece that can kind of act as a distraction card effects, you know, just constantly chucking rocks at your opponent, so they have to react to it. But then if they overcommit or, you know, whatever, then you can punish them with your mobile units. Um, so I guess that kind of leads us into uh, sample builds here. Let me see what I've got in the old hopper here. I didn't actually look through my builds beforehand to see if I had any Beastman builds. Um, it looks like, uh, yeah, we've got uh, a, a build here featuring just what I was talking about. So uh, the idea here is we're going to park this I Have More Sleep sort of in the back um, and use, use that warp gaze very aggressively in trying to single out any mobile units that break through. And then basically you can see we've, we've just got a ton of centigors of various types. And the idea is we're going to hit and run, just constantly be running around, constantly moving, constantly throwing axes, charging in, backing out. And with the, the Saigor dropping rocks, it's just so much pressure to deal with. Again, very micro-intensive, but can potentially be very powerful. Malagor the Dark Omen here is... Uh, you know, depending on what spell selection and, and how 
how mean you want to be, essentially. Um, you know, you could even do something like this and bring just the Saigor summon on him. And uh, maybe you bring Bestial Surge and Vile Tide for the late game just in case. Um, but if you really wanted to uh, min-max here, you could do something like this. And uh, maybe we'll uh, we'll cut the item as well just so that we can afford one more Spearman Herd. And yeah, uh, essentially you're just going to summon more Saigors with him, preferably spread away from the uh, Eye of Morslib so that your opponent's forced to make a choice of do I go after the Eye of Morslib, do I go after the Summon Saigor, because they're both going to be throwing rocks at me constantly regardless of what I do. So it kind of pulls your opponent apart. And again, that's that's the goal here is you want to... You want to pull your opponent apart. You don't ever want to take a, an unfavorable engagement. You want to dictate the pace of the battle as much as possible. That means seasoning the mobility advantage, which is why this build goes so heavy on mobility. Um, you know, obviously, more competitive builds would be using Morgur. I'm, I'm surprised I don't actually have a Morgur build, but I could quickly throw one together here. So, uh, in most competitive play, you're going to see builds pretty similar to this with uh, Morgur. I've cut his two abilities just to make him a bit cheaper. Lore of Shadows is incredibly, popu uh, incredibly popular and powerful. Uh, Lore of Death, Wild, I mean... Even beasts, if you want to go with, like, Amber Spear to shoot enemy heavy cavalry. But for the sake of this particular video, I'm going to go with Shadows because I think it's one of the strongest. We're going to take Melkos, uh, Enfeebling Foe, and the Penumbral Pendulum. And then uh, we're going to need some mobile units. So, uh, obviously, depending on the faction, like, let's say we're playing a traditional heavy cavalry faction, like Bretonia or the High Elves, uh, we're going to go with the Eye of Morslib for some control, a couple of Ungor, uh, sorry, the uh, Razorgor herds, along with some Poison Warhounds, just to act as kind of a, a line breakers and to chase opposing heavy cavalry if they get into an un unfavorable situation. I'm going to grab the uh, Korox Man Rippers here, and we'll definitely want lots of bodies. Uh, we're going to grab some Ungor Spearman Herd with shields. And we're also going to want Centigors, obviously. So we're going to grab a couple of Centigors with uh, great weapons and maybe one with throwing axes. Something like this I think might be pretty solid. Again, just kind of spitballing here. But there's a lot of different directions that you can go with Morgur. You can go more mobile focused, more infantry focused. But generally, I found this to be reasonably effective. Of course, if you really wanted to uh, to make this pop, you could include the Butchers of Kalkengard. And I would recommend taking these guys in most matchups i mean they're just such a powerful unit so you know you could do something like uh hmm how would we how would we cut this down here so let's rethink our strategy with the caster rather than putting him on the chariot we're gonna just keep him on foot maybe uh let's see we had shadows and yeah we'll just keep him on foot there and keep him with the same spells just to make him a bit cheaper this has given us enough to get the Butchers of Kalkengard and maybe even go ahead and get one more, oh, not quite enough for one more squad of uh, Hounds and the Razor Grow Herd. I guess we could get the regular Hounds. Unfortunately, we don't have the poison there, but again, just kind of spitballing here, guys. Um, sorry I didn't have any more pre-prepared builds for you, but, you know, there's again, there's a lot of different directions you can go here, but typically... The most important point I would say is that the Beastmen, again, rely very heavily on getting favorable engagements and using terrain to your advantage, you know, pulling your opponent apart and not really playing a heads-up game. I mean, a lot of people say that the Beastmen are a powerful heads-up rush faction, and they can be, but I would say that they're not really meant to be played that way. Um, certainly against some of the pure rush factions like like Chaos, uh, Greenskins, Dark Elves can play very rush, rushy builds, very powerful rush builds. Norska, you know, the, the Beastmen are going to struggle to go head-to-head -head with those type of very heavy rush factions, which is why I think that the, the more kind of uh, kite you know, hit-and-run, almost Wood Elf style uh, mobility type play is, is really where the Beastmen shine the most. So, uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed watching. Kind of a long-winded video, like uh, many of my other overviews have been. But hopefully you found this interesting and informative. If you guys do like this sort of content, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell notification button. So every time I upload a new video, you'll be notified. We'll recommend what faction you want me to do next in the comments down below. And we'll see if I can get to it. Preferring to do Old World factions right now, just because they're mostly done at this point. Not expecting... I mean, some of them are going to get some updates, certainly. Um, but I'm not, uh, not expecting too much down 
down the road, which is why I'm making these ones, because they're a little bit more future-proof than if I were to do, say, like, obviously the Skaven and the Lizardmen don't even have their regiments of renown yet, so uh, we'll be mostly sticking to the Old World, but maybe I'll consider doing, like, the High Elves, since I think they've pretty much got all their legendary lords, but uh, anyway, let me know what you guys want to see next in the comments down below, and we'll see you next time.